Good morning, friends. As we remain standing, let me pray for us. Our loving Father, we pray that as we come to your word, the Bible, we would hear you speak to us, that we would uh, be thrilled in heart and mind by everything that you have done and continue to do. We pray that our lives may be, ch may be shaped by your word to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do be seated. The uh, expression Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one widely used to speak of someone who acts very differently in different situations. Someone who's moral and respectable in one setting, but lewd and leery in another. It comes, uh, if you can see the screen, from this book, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Dr. Jekyll is a respectable doctor of impeccable moral character. But he develops a potion to turn him into the wild Mr. Hyde, who's violent and murderous. And so Dr. Jekyll's able to lead a double life and indulge some of his deepest fantasies. He looks smart and respectable on the outside, but by taking the potion, he can turn himself into Mr. Hyde and can indulge his darkest wishes. Just a dose of the potion turns him into Mr. Hyde, another dose turns him back into the respectable Dr. Jekyll. The trouble is, as time goes on, he turns into the evil Mr. Hyde without wanting to. And eventually, he runs out of the potion. He's unable to turn himself back into Dr. Jekyll. He's stuck as Mr. Hyde. The book's author, Robert Louis Stevenson, said this about the book. I've called my character Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde but I could equally well have called him Robert Louis Stevenson. I wonder if you know within yourself that experience of which Stevenson spoke of being two different people. There's a moral, respectable version of you that you like to present to the world, particularly at a gathering like this. But there's a dark side to you that you think others would be shocked by if they saw it for what it really is, that you hate in yourself and, and kind of wish wasn't there. The trouble is, just like in the book, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you seem to have little control over which side of you comes out. Well, friends, if you can relate to that at all, Ezekiel 36 that we're looking at this morning is a wonderful passage for you. Please could you turn to it in your Bibles. It's on pages 867 and 868. 867 and 868. We've been in the book of Ezekiel in our services for the past month. If you've missed it, well actually from our passage, verses 16 to 21 are a pretty good summary of what's gone before. This is Ezekiel speaking, uh, who was a prophet in verse 16, and he says, Again the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they'd shed blood in the land and because they defiled it with idols. The majority of the message of Ezekiel up until this point has been a message of judgment. Uh, God's Old Testament people, Israel, had turned away from God. Instead of worshipping him alone as they were called to, uh, they tried also to worship other gods, to worship idols. And because of this, they had become, in God's uh, sight, unclean. That is, unfit to be his people. And God reminds his people of the outcome of their actions in verse 19. I dispersed them, says God, among the nations, and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. Actually, Ezekiel himself and the people he ministered at two would have known that all too well. For when the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, he was in Babylon, hundreds of miles away 
from his homeland and from Jerusalem, the capital city. He'd been among the exiles carried off by the victorious Babylonian soldiers. Again, if you can uh, see the map, the red line shows uh, the route taken uh, from Judah, uh, from Israel, over in the west, or if you struggle with geographical terms, the left, uh, sort of up and over to, uh, to Babylon uh, there. But actually, God's big concern in this, and we see it throughout the passage, is not that his people are having a bit of a miserable time in Babylon as exiles. They deserve that fully. It was a just punishment uh, from God. His great concern is for the effect that this has had on his own reputation. So verse 20, this is still God speaking. He says, And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, These are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. You see, the land of Israel wasn't any old land. It was the land that God had promised to Abraham and his descendants forever. And yet, those descendants of Abraham were not living in the land of Israel. Instead, they were hundreds of miles away, living as slaves in Babylon. And you can almost imagine how the conversation might have gone in the marketplace in Babylon. Oh, who are those latest lot of conquered people to arrive? They're the Israelites, apparently. Israelites, eh? What a rubbish nation they must be. Our mighty army conquered them. Yeah, I'll tell you what's really funny. They reckoned they would live in their land forever because their God had promised it to them. <laughs> what a rubbish God they must have. What's he called? Oh, it's something weird. Something like Yahweh or, or, or the Lord. <laughs> What a rubbish God. It's not like our God Marduk, is he? He always looks after our army. The fact, the very fact that the Israelites were uh, in exile profaned the name of the Lord. Just in case they're struggling to, to quite understand that, it's there in verse 20, verse 21, verse 22, and verse 23 twice. And the message of this passage is that for the sake of his name, God will act. God will act to cleanse his people from their sin. God will act to change them by his spirit. And God will act to bless them greatly. Why will he do these things? Well, it's spelt out in verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you've profaned among the nations where you have gone. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, God declares his love for Israel. But the emphasis here is that the Lord is acting for the, his own sake, for the sake of his name. The Israelites, being in exile, had profaned the name of the Lord, and now he's going to act for the sake of his holy name. Now, that helps us with what's going on in 6th century BC Babylon, uh, the immediate context to which Ezekiel spoke. But we're not in 6th century Babylon, we're 27 centuries later on in 21st century Britain. So how does God speak to us through Ezekiel 36? Just have a look down, you'll see that the central section of this passage, the central paragraph from verses 24 to 32, is full of the Lord saying, I will, this is what I will do, I will, I will, I will. It's there 11 times in these verses. And it's looking forward to what God will do. And it seems to be looking forward to a single event. Perhaps I, I can illustrate it like this. If you look at the shape on the screen, what I imagine you see is a circle. If you see something different, please get your eyes tested this week. There's a circle there on the screen. But if you were able to take a, a side view of what you're looking at... Well, it might be that what you find is that far from it being a circle, it would be that sort of cylinder uh, shape that is there. For those uh, in 6th century Babylon who received the Lord's message through Ezekiel, they would have thought uh, that a single event, what God will do, 
is being spoken about. But for us today, we can see that rather than speaking about a single event, Ezekiel 36 is speaking about what God is doing, drawn out over centuries. See, there was a partial fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 a few decades later when some of the exiles did return to the land of Israel. But the true fulfillment comes in the first coming of Jesus to earth and in the period between his first coming and his promised return. In other words, we are living now in the period of what God is doing as he promised 27 centuries ago through Ezekiel. What we're going to see from uh, Ezekiel 36 it is three things. Here's the first. God cleanses us from all our sin. God cleanses us from all our sin. Have a look down to verse 24. And again, this is God speaking, and he says, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Israel, remember, had been sent into exile so that not only were they far from their homeland, they were also far from Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem where they believed the very presence of God was. But God's promise here in verse 24 is that he will gather his people and when he gathers them, he will cleanse them. So verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. And we see the promise of God to gather people to himself and cleanse them from their sin fulfilled in the death of Jesus. We heard in our second reading from John 12, Jesus speaking shortly before his death. And he said this, I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, and that meant physically lifted up as he was nailed to the cross, I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw, will gather all people to myself. The cross is the means by which God gathers his people, and the cross is the means by which he cleanses us. So verse 25 of our passage again, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, and from all your idols. Can I ask you just to dwell on that word, all? My experience uh, over the years is that many people who are trusting in Jesus and his death in their place believe that although God cleanses from kind of ordinary sin, run-of-the-mill kind of sin, there's something that they've done in their lives which is so serious, so bad, that actually the death of Jesus can't possibly cleanse them from that. Uh, this passage speaks of sin as impurity, and that idea of feeling dirty because of sin is one that, that very many people kind of relate to. Yes, I feel dirty, I've done this. But often that's uh, perhaps some sexual sin, some act of adultery, and they feel, look, I know Jesus cleanses from sin, but he doesn't cleanse me from that sin. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's some act of dishonesty or some moral failure. Sometimes it's just the reality of a Mr. Hyde side to your existence. And you think, if I'm like this, I can't have been cleansed. I'm not really forgiven. But look at verse 25 again. See what the living God says. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. All. All your impurities, all your idols, no exceptions, no caveats, all. If you are trusting in Jesus' death, he has cleansed you from every sin you have committed. You have not earned that. You haven't cleansed yourself. You haven't taken a bit of a moral shower or bath yourself. No, God has cleansed you. It's him who's done it. If 
if you're here today and you're not trusting in Jesus and his death for you, but you know what it is to feel guilty and to feel dirty from the things that you've done, then can I urge you to put your trust in Jesus' death for you? What he offers is complete cleansing from all your sin, and there's nowhere else that that cleansing can be found, only in Jesus. God cleanses us from all our sin. Secondly, God changes us by his spirit. Verse 26, there's still God speaking, and he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The first heart transplant took place on December the 3rd, 1967, uh, in South Africa. But actually, God has been doing heart transplants for centuries, just as he promised he would through Ezekiel. The heart in Hebrew thought, it wasn't a place of sort of fluttery emotion, as we often speak of the heart today, nor was it just the, the pump that uh, sends blood round the body. No, the heart was the place where decisions were made, uh, where a life was formed, was in the heart. God speaks in verse 26 of the people of Israel having a heart of stone. In other words, they were hardened towards him. Right the way through the Old Testament, God had said to his people how they were to live. His decrees and laws spoken of in verse 27 is shorthand for the whole of his revealed will. But the people of Israel's hearts were hard. They had deliberately gone against God and his will. Their hearts were hard and their spirits, the innermost part of them, instinctively went against God. And friends, that is not just the people of Israel then. That is us today without God's gracious intervention. We are naturally hard-hearted and mean-spirited. And if you know I've been ill for a couple of months, one of the things I've most learned about myself, I'm hard-hearted and I'm mean-spirited. And if God had left us all alone, we would be utterly hopeless and wretched. But praise God, he's not left us all alone. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. When we put our trust in Jesus, as we're cleansed from our sin, we're also given a heart transplant. In place of our hearts of stone, we're given a heart of flesh. In other words, a soft that wants to go God's way. I came to put my trust in Jesus when I was uh, in the sixth form at boarding school. And part of the culture, at any rate, in the boarding school uh, I attended was that those in the sixth form made the lives of the younger pupils, particularly those in their boarding house, as miserable and uncomfortable as they possibly could. When I came to put my trust in Jesus, for me, that stopped pretty much overnight. No one had to tell me to stop being horrible to the younger boys in my house. Humanly speaking, I just stopped doing those things. I sought to be kind to them instead, much to the dismay of some of my contemporaries. But, but as I look back now, 25 years or so, spiritually speaking, God had taken away my heart of stone and given me a heart of flesh. Maybe if your trust in Jesus, you can you can see something similar in your own life. And not only that, verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. God is speaking here of the Holy Spirit who's given to each person who trusts in Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives within us and changes us from within so that increasingly we want to live lives of obedience to God. Lives which please him. We started by thinking about the fictional character Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And thinking that though 
the character is fictional, the reality it describes is all too familiar. A and though we may fight the Mr. Hyde within us, if we're fighting our dark side alone, it is a battle that we'll lose again and again and again. But if we're trusting in Christ, God has placed his Holy Spirit within us and he's changing us. Now sometimes that process of change is deeply uncomfortable because why did Dr. Jekyll create Mr. Hyde? Because he wanted to do those things. And we do love sinning. There's something very appealing uh, about it. So as the Holy Spirit changes us, that, that's not a comfortable thing. It's not always an easy thing. It's not always a rapid thing. Sometimes we despair about how slow the rate of change within us seems to be. We're told in Galatians 5 that we must keep in step with the Spirit, to be willing partners with him uh, as he changes us from within. But if your trust is in Christ, God is changing you. God changes us by his Spirit. Thirdly and finally, God blesses us greatly. God blesses us greatly. Verse 28. God says, You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Now that, that little phrase, You will be my people, and I will be your God, that's an echo of something God had said about a thousand years previously uh, to Moses about his people, Israel, who at that time were living in slavery. Then uh, the land of Egypt, here the land of Babylon. God is saying to the Israelites, even after their rebellion against God, even after the agony of exile, far away from their homeland, God is promising that he will again intervene. They will be his people, and he will be their God. And the mark of that will be great blessing. Verse 29. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the corn and make it plentiful. And will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field. So that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. God promises that he will bless his people. And that privilege of being the people of God is the privilege of all who trust in Jesus. Earlier in the service, during the uh, baptism, Tom uh, addressed us in exactly that way. He said, people of God, will you welcome these children? Today, through trust in Christ, those of us who do, we are the people of God. And we know the blessing of God. That blessing is expressed in Ezekiel 36 solely in material terms, in terms of fruitful crops and no more famine. Part of the blessing of God that we enjoy today is in material terms. The reason we're here today, clothed and fed and watered, is because God is good to us. Now God doesn't promise us material prosperity. But as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, God has blessed us. In the, spirit, in the heavenly realms, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, and actually, if you remember at the cylinder, the period, let me go back to it, of what God is doing, that doesn't conclude until the second coming of Jesus. It's there when Jesus returns in the new heaven and new earth that we will know the full extent of the blessing of God when he will gather all his people, all who trust in Christ, to be with him for all eternity. We know we rejoice in something of the blessing of God now. That day we will know it fully and eternally. So we've seen that God cleanses us from all our sin. God changes us by his spirit. God blesses us greatly. What should we do as a result? Three elements very briefly I'm going to draw out. Here's the first. We should hate our sin. God has said that he will bless his people, having cleansed them from their sins and changed their hearts uh, within them. So their sin has been dealt with, and yet, verse 31, then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins 
and detestable practices. Remember, God has said he will cleanse his people from all their sins. And yet, when they remember what they've done, God says they will hate themselves for those things. If we're trusting in Christ, God has forgiven all our sin. You can never hear that too much. And yet, we should still hate our sin. Receiving God's forgiveness should never make us comfortable with sin. Quite the opposite, we should hate it all the more. Here's the second thing. Know that God acts for God's sake. It's a thread that runs right the way through the passage. It's there again in verse 32. This is a massive biblical theme we're not going to unpack this morning. But we need to understand that Jesus dying on the cross, it's not just for our benefit. Actually, it brings God glory. Jesus' prayer, we heard it in John 12, as he prepares to go to the cross, he prayed, Father, glorify your name. And the reply came back from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. We need to understand that the cross is how God is most glorified. For as Jesus dies on the cross, the character and the love of God are shown to the world. Third application, ask God to increase his people. Have a look with me to verse 37 and 38, the last two verses. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Once again I will yield to the plea of the house of Israel and do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep, as numerous as the flocks for offerings at Jerusalem during her appointed feast. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. It seems that in exile, the people whose numbers had been radically diminished by war were saying to God, please increase our number, please increase our number. And up until this point, God has been saying, no, I'm not going to do that. The punishment isn't yet complete. But his promise here is that the people will act, ask for the, the number of people to be increased, and God will act. God has said that he will respond to the people's prayer. Not just for them. As we ask, God increases the number of his people, the number who trust in Jesus. It's an obvious question, but do we pray in this way? Do we ask God to increase the number who trust in Jesus and are made part of his people? I wonder if the answer to that is no, it's because we've lost sight of how wonderful the gospel is. There's no other way that anyone can be cleansed from sin except by Jesus. There's no other way to be changed from within and blessed greatly except by what God has done in Jesus. Friends, for those of us who know these amazing privileges ourselves, we should be begging God to increase his people through more and more coming to trust in Jesus. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for how we see the promises made uh, through Ezekiel being fulfilled in this period between the first coming of the Lord Jesus and his return. We pray that we would uh, rejoice in these things and yet hate our sin. We pray that we would have great concern for your glory and that we would be those who ask that you would add to our number those whom you are saving through the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray.